Thank you very much. It's very kind of you, and uh, I appreciate very much your kind introduction. Let me uh, begin this uh, summary talk or concluding talk by indicating that uh, I have been given an impossible task a task that is not possible to accomplish. I did not volunteer to give this. I have been asked to give this talk, and uh, I am sure that my remarks will be oversimplified, that I will not say all of the things that I meant to say, that it will not be exhaustive, uh, it will not be thorough, it will not be complete, and uh, so I warn you that this is one person's opinion. And that brings me to the most important thing, especially for you students. The reason we have these scientific meetings is really twofold. For the people in the science to talk with each other and to learn from each other the latest, important, useful in insights that they have. But far more important are the students. Much more important than these experts are the students, because you represent the future. You represent what will happen 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And what is important here is that you do not believe me or do not believe any of these experts. Now, you should believe only one thing about the quote experts. That is that they will not knowingly mislead you. They will not tell you mistruths. They will not say things that they know to be wrong. They're good experts. But they are not always right. None of us is uh, perfect. And your job as a student is to be much better than me or any of these experts up here. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you should make us look like old men and women who didn't know anything because you've learned all these new things. So with that, I can stop now. No. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I am going to uh, quote a U.S. United States military person. Uh, and I apologize for that. I must say I do not like to speak about the United States military. I do not like to think about the United States military. However, I do make the exception for this quotation from Donald Rumsfeld, who was the United States Secretary of Defense. He was asked in February of 2002 to justify the American presence in Iraq to look for weapons of mass destruction, which you think has nothing to do with the origin of life, but the question is a good one if you think about it in that context. He said, not about the origin of life, but about weapons of mass destruction. He said, well, there are known knowns things that we know we know. There are known unknowns, things that we know we don't know. And 
there are, however, also unknown unknowns, things that we don't know, we do not know. Now, it's a little complicated, but if you think about it, it actually is applicable to the origin of life. There are known knowns. Now, we call those in science facts. Those are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns, things that we know we don't know, and for these we call them hypotheses or estimates or guesses. And then there are unknown unknowns, things we don't know we do not know, these are questions that we haven't even asked. And if we have not asked the question, we have no answer. And so we don't know what, the, what we don't know. And if we don't know what we don't know, we can't talk about what we don't know. So I'm not going to talk about the unknown unknowns. Now that I've got you confused, I am going to talk about the origin of life. And to me, the origin of life is really a very simple problem. These experts make it so complicated. It really is very, very easy. We start off with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and energy uh, that is uh, made into either in meteorites and comets and it's made on Earth and it's made into monomers. And those monomers dissolve in water and you have a consomme, a dilute organic primordial soup. Dehydration condensation or other processes result in the formation of polymers. Those polymers, some of them become RNA-like molecules. Uh, they get encapsulated into soap-like bubbles called protocells. Those protocells uh, evolve through time, uh, develop primitive metabolism and cell walls and so forth and become true cells. And after a while, you get evolved cells. And that is the history of the origin of life. And you see, it is very, very easy, very straightforward. And we have learned in this conference uh, about Chan and energy monomers and consummate from Antonio Lascano. And then we have learned about uh, metabolism uh, and about uh, uh, the, uh, the early metabolism by Fid uh, Mikhail Fidonkin and Mikhail uh, Sergeyevich Kritsky have taught us uh, the uh, early history of the biosphere. So let's I could go home right now, but there are some other unknown unknowns, and about the known knowns, the facts we know about the early environment and the timing of the origin of life, well, we know the primordial environment was anoxic and received a high ultraviolet flux. That's known. That's, we'll accept that as a fact. And that the life-generating environment, the place where life originated on this planet, was in water. It's an aqueous sort of system. And probably it was marine. That is, not fresh water. It probably was in some sort of salty environment because that's what most of uh, the water on this planet is like. Those are knowns. Those are known knowns. Uh, but the unknown unknowns, when did life uh, evolve? Now, some microbiologists will say, oh gosh, it's during the first billion years. But a billion years is a billion years. It's an uh, enormously long period of time. We don't know the answer to that. And, and where did life evolve? Okay, those are important unknowns. And 
in terms of the origin of life, oh, it's back here, certainly in that first billion years, because the oldest fossils known are three and a half billion years in age. But we really don't know uh, within that period of time. And the reason we do not know that is because there are essentially no rocks. Okay, okay, there is a rock outcrop in the southwestern Greenland that is 3.8 billion years in age, and that rock outcrop is about the size of this stage. Well, it might be two stages, but it's very small. And that's about all we have, because all of the early history of the Earth has eroded away over time. So that's a constraint that we have, and we, but we really don't know uh, when life began. And that's important, because these earliest organisms at three and a half billion years in age, they are already very complicated biochemical systems. So we don't know what preceded them. So that's an unknown. And then the question is, where did life evolve? And if you read the literature and you talk with the experts, some will say it's in hot springs. Some will say it's in cooling lavas. Some will say it's in lagoons. Some will say it's in deep sea muds. As other people will say it's in submarine fumaroles, and some in the open ocean, and some say it's in near shore environments. And then there are people who say, oh, well, we need to make many different chemical reactions. It's not a simple thing to make the origin of life, so there must be many steps. And consequently, instead of just one environment, why don't we have a combination? The way a biochemist would approach the problem, you do this in this flask, and then you pour that into another flask, and you pour it into another flask, and then you put it over here, and you put it over there, and after a while, life emerges. Well, that's a serious question, because, you see, we would like to be able to know where life began, in what sort of environment, uh, and one of the, the things that we don't know is where it began. Now we do know the, the sequence of events, and the, the sequence of events has to be something like this, from biodiverse to polymers to com compartmentalization to genetics and metabolism being linked into some sort of a cellular RNA world. It has to be something like that. That must be a good approximation. I accept that as a known known. But unknown unknowns, there are many, many, many details. What polymers? We heard here today in, in this meeting about amyloids and prions. Interesting idea. There's not much written about that. But there are lots of other polymers as well. Compartmentalization. We heard a little bit about liposomes. Nobody talked about fatty acid vesicles, which is the other favorite thing. And of course, oparins and coacerbates as well. What about pre-RNA genetic molecules? I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, how, what was the early genetics, and how did genetics get linked to metabolism? And what about the cellular RNA world? There is no evidence for a cellular RNA world. There are no organisms that lack, uh, that, are, uh, that are cellular primitive organisms of the type from that RNA world. That is a, a, an interesting, important, and probably correct concept. Uh, but uh, in terms of real-world uh, data, uh, it doesn't exist. Now, we heard about going from charm to energy to monomers, uh, going back to the work of Stanley Miller and all of the syntheses that have been made ever since. Uh, and so we understand that monomers are easy, uh, we think, uh, in 
variety of ways with a variety of energy sources to synthesize. And we heard here from Ernesto Di Mauro, uh, who gave a very nice lecture dealing with that subject. Uh, I want to point out uh, one of the great unknowns, and that is where is the primordial soup? Now, my friends, this is, this is something I have been personally looking for, keeping my eyes out for, for now nearly 50 years. Uh, and I can, I can tell you, there is no firm evidence of non-biological organic matter preserved in the geological record that is now known or has been identified. There is no primordial soup that we know in the geological record. It, it must have been there, we think, so it must precede the oldest continuous rock record that it stops at 3.5 billion years. But it's very frustrating that, that, you know, I thought as a young man I could go back through time, get to a point where there was no life, and, and look at the rocks older than that and find the primordial soup. It hasn't worked. It's not my fault. Nature did not cooperate with me. So, that's an unknown unknown. We've got to find that primordial soup because that's the linchpin in the notions that we have about the origin of life. Now, monomers to polymers, and here's proteins and enzymes and DNA polymers shown. Uh, okay, we know that you've got to get polymerization. Those monomers have to become polymerized. Uh, and we know how that happens in living cells. This is called dehydration condensation. Dehydration condensation. What that means, Instead of to make a, 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 a protein, is you take two amino acids, one molecule of water is given off, the hydroxyl group in one amino acid and hydrogen from the other to make H2O, the molecule of water is given off, and now you get a dipeptide, you make the peptide bond. Now that requires, it's dehydration, because you're giving off a mo molecule of water, and condensation, because you were condensing or bringing together two monomers. Now, in living cells, that requires adenosine triphosphate, uh, ADP, ATP. You need ATP and you need an enzyme system to make that bond. Now, we heard uh, a little bit in this meeting from Sergei uh, Varfolomeyev, uh, about how to make uh, these polymers. Let me point out that this dehydration condensation is not simply the way you make proteins. This is the way we make biologic systems make carbohydrates, like cellulose, for example, to make the glycosidic bond uh, that links glucose monomers. It's the same thing, it's dehydration condensation. That's the way we make nucleic acids. By linking up the sugar and the base, you lose a molecule of water. Now, the nucleoside to the phosphate, you lose a mo molecule of water. The nucleotide linkage, it's the same thing. This is, goes right through biology. It's very, very basic, but needs ATP, and it needs enzymes. Uh, and you're taking off a molecule of water. You think that this happened on the early Earth in an aqueous marine environment. Folks, that is like washing, trying to dry your hands with a wet west, uh, washcloth. Uh, you're trying to get rid of a mo molecule of water in an aqueous environment. So there has to be a way to solve that problem. The way it is solved is currently, and we heard a little bit about this, uh, you, you heat and dry these things as on lava, for example, to drive off the water, or you could uh, latch them onto clays uh, in, as in a drying out lagoon, 
or you can use condensing agents uh, that come in in carbonaceous meteorites. So there are ways to get around that problem, and it's been done experimentally. Uh, we don't know which one of those was important, and we don't know uh, what sorts of polymers were made, and there must have been a vast, vast array of them. Okay, okay, polymer assembly, we come back to the environment problem, and the question then becomes, uh, where? Where did these polymers uh, uh, assemble? Uh, uh, in what sort of environment should we uh, imagine that to have occurred? How did they assemble? Well, uh, it's something like dehydration condensation without enzymes and without ATP. Uh, but we heard from the, from the talk uh, given on behalf of Dave Deemer uh, that hydrothermal environments might be an answer to that question. Okay, but what? What was being assembled? RNA, proteins, prions, amyloids, pre-RNA analogs? Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, potential uh, polymers that were made, uh, and we focus on RNA in particular, but RNA, uh, and Tara Barazian uh, gave a very nice discussion of the uh, prions and amyloids and so forth, and we, we learned a lot about that. Uh, but <clears throat> There's a, always the ribose problem. Ribose is not preferentially synthesized in a foremost reaction, for example. You get 40 different sugars, you need, and, and ribose is just a small amount. So oh, you can stabilize ribose, but you don't necessarily stabilize ribose preferentially to other sugars. Uh, and so people have said that's a ribose problem, and so they've come up with, with pre-ribose uh, 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 nucleic acid uh, uh, complexes uh, using hexatol uh, nucleic acid or threos uh, nucleic acid or gly a glycosol, uh, a glycerol nucleic acid or peptide nucleic acids. All of these have been suggested as precursors of RNA uh, because they could be synthesized presumably uh, under more prebiotic conditions. But that's a, a known unknown. We don't really know. Uh, we know ribose, and we know that ribonucleic acid was very important in the, in the RNA world, world is real, but we don't know uh, the precursors. Now we get to compartmentalization. And this was mentioned a few moments ago, uh, and we have a good model for how cells and cell membranes evolve, where they come from, why they are there. And it basically has to do with the polarity of the water molecule, of which you're all familiar, but it is that polarity of the water molecule that causes soap bubbles to bubble and oil and water to not mix. Uh, it is the polarity of water that causes that so that you get hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, portions uh, at the periphery and the organics mixed together. We know that that is the reason that organics glom together, dissolve in each other in an aqueous system. And we know that that must be a precursor to cells in some sense. Uh, but the details of it are not uh, well worked out. Uh, the two model systems that are used, uh, liposomes, which are phospholipid vesicles, as shown here, water in the outside, water in the middle, and there's a nonpolar layer in between, and then polar ends, and fatty acid vesicles. Uh, 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 we had a good lecture on, from Chef uh, uh, uh using uh, liposomes, which is his preferred uh, Proto cell, but if Jack Shostak were here, uh, he would say, "Oh no, I prefer fatty acid vesicles." Well, nobody really knows; it's the same sort of a problem, and they are essentially soap bubbles uh, in a liquid environment. So we know we have a good model for how. The
these, the cells became, become compartmentalized. We don't know in detail. And then there's the RNA world. 20 years ago, nobody would talk about the RNA world. Now, the RNA world, there are even books written about the RNA world. Ah, it must be real. There are books written about it. Uh, and we heard a bunch of good talks, the Spooner et al. talk, and Enzo Galari, and uh, 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 Marie-Christine Morel, and uh, A.B. Uh, uh on aspects of the RNA world. And it is, in fact, uh, a, I'm sure, uh, at least I would accept it as a fact, not uh, a, a known known, not an unknown. Uh, even though we don't have direct evidence, it makes such good sense that I cannot imagine it not being the precursor of a DNA world. Uh, and one of the prime things that convinces me, and I know convinced Leslie Orgel, and I know has convinced a lot of people in this field, is the nature of ribosomes. Now, ribosomes uh, have uh, you know, the large subunit, the small subunit, and where the, all the action takes place where proteins are synthesized is right down here in this groove. And if you look at the nature of a ribosome, it has a protein cover in green. If you remove that, you can see that the large subunit and the small subunit uh, are almost entirely made out of ribosomal RNA. And that says that protein synthesis comes from an R ribosomal RNA system. And that says to me that by golly, that's where protein synthesis started. That is where uh, the, the RNA world was. And then the DNA world is a derivative. So I think that's a known known. And then we get to what is called the last universal common ancestor. Now, we know a lot about, these are known knowns about the last common ancestor because you can get, you can look at all living systems and see what is most common or common or universal to all living systems. And there's a great list of these things. But in, basically, I think it, it must be true that the last common ancestor uh, was microscopic. I think it was coil. I think it was single cell. I think it was marine. I think it was anaerobic. I think it was thermophilic. I think it exhibited glycolysis because glycolysis is present in all living systems that live today. And it exhibited Darwinian evolution. That's the last universal common ancestor of everything living today. That's a very, very different question from asking about the origin of life. There are known unknowns, and it could be that there were many origins of life, and that the last universal common ancestor is simply the surviving lineage of many lineages that once lived. And another known unknown is whether life is rare or common in the, in the universe or the cosmos. So here, uh, we've heard, we heard brilliant work this morning. Four different papers dealing with thermophilic early organisms of the last universal common ancestor. Okay, we've got, uh, up here we've got Aquaflex. We've got a whole bunch of uh, Archaeans and a whole bunch of other Archaeans, and they're all listed here. And the list goes on and on. And they're all down here at the base of the universal uh, tree of life. But the universal tree of life is far, far removed from the origin of life. And the folks who gave the, the talks this morning, uh, Amoka Dajan, Jan uh, Stetter, and uh, uh, Lisa, uh, and Yamagishi, uh, really, really very, very nice work. But folks, as Carl Stetter pointed out to us, here we've got the last common ancestor. The origin of life is down here, three floors below. 
There's much that has happened all the way up, 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 and that question mark is a very large question mark, and we do not have direct evidence of that. So you must separate the origin of life from the last common ancestor. Okay, uh, and uh, how many origins of life were there? Well, I'm now going to give you the canonical view. That is the view that you will read in the textbooks. And that is that uh, it is true. This is a fact. The Earth, early Earth, was bombarded with meteors. There's no doubt about that. And based on the crater record of meteor bombardment on the moon, and based on the individual rock samples that were picked up by American astronauts in the Apollo program, Apollo 11 and 12 and 14 up through 17, and those were brought back to Earth. We can date those rocks, we can date the craters they came from, and uh, Gene Shoemaker and a number of other folks since I looked at that and said, oh boy, there were lots and lots of, of uh, meteorite bombardment up to 3.9 billion. And that's what is called the late heavy bombardment. Ah, well, imagine life gets started back here at 4 billion or 4.4 billion. It starts to go up, everything's going fine, and then a large meteor comes in vaporizes portions of the ocean and kills off that life. And so then it starts again and it gets killed off. It starts again and gets killed off. And so the model says that, well, you get finally, uh, after the late bombardment, uh, you get the origin of sustained life, which you see is only 400 million years before the oldest fossil. Okay, and we know we've got plenty of life from 3.5 up. So that is the current view. Let me tell you uh, that that view will be altered in the next two years, largely through the work of Dawn Lowe at the Stanford University, who uh, is looking at meteorite craters and, and uh, evidence, geologic evidence of meteorite impacts and it turns out, uh, through his work and reanalysis of the statistical distribution of craters on the moon, that this late heavy bombardment is going to be referred to as a medium heavy bombardment because it will turn out that there are a lot more meteorites coming into the Earth up to three, three billion years ago. A lot more will be shown here relatively fewer here, and the curve of meteorite impacts will be something like that. Uh, it will be smoothed out and not be as much as it is now. So don't trust, don't trust the late heavy bombardment. Uh, just wait two years, see the new data, and then make your own judgment about it. Okay? Your judgment is what matters. All right, so that's that. And finally, um, and I mean finally, uh, when will life be discovered beyond the solar system? Now, we got a little inkling of that from the one and only James F. Casting uh, just a few moments ago. But let me give you the latest. This is the latest stuff. It, and, and, you know, look at these other, these other experts who've been talking to you. They will, they will uh, reference really fine scientific journals, nature, science, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, biochemica, uh, biochemia uh, here in, in, in Moscow, and so forth. They will reference all those. Well, I'm not going to reference those. I'm going to show you data from Time magazine. Time, the weekly news magazine of September 8th through 15th, 
That's my source of data. I'm an American. Now, uh, the Milky Way galaxy has more than 100 billion planetary systems. The estimated habitable planets are more than 200 billion in the Milky Way galaxy. Estimated systems with civilizations estimated between 10,000 and a million. Uh, today, 2014, uh, we've only examined one, uh, something more than a thousand of these planetary systems. Uh, exoplanet is, uh, that are accepted now, something around 2,000. Uh, but that exoplanet discovery is doubling every two years. So by 2030, we should look at one million systems. And by 2040, we will have looked at 10 million systems. And you see if that is true, and this estimate of numbers of uh, populated uh, civilizations and life elsewhere, we're going to find life in the next 26 years. Now, take it from here. It's published. You know, you students, if it's published, it must be true. It must be true. It's right there. You see the data right before you. Okay, well that was uh, not exactly what James F. Casting talked about. However, I got his name up there on the screen. Uh, and let me say, in summary, the known knowns about the origin of life, uh, the primordial life-generating environment was anoxic, a high UV flux, it was aqueous, it was marine. I believe it's a fact that the, the sequence of events goes from monomers to polymers to compartmentalization to ge genetics and metabolism to some sort of a cellular world. And I believe that the last universal common ancestor was microscopic hypoidal single cell burning anaerobic thermophilic. Uh, exhibited glycolysis and Darwinian evolution, uh, and uh, uh, Carpathian gave us a good, good dis discussion of uh, how it is that early cyanobacteria can withstand the the rigors of the early environment uh, uh, back around three billion or two and a half billion years ago, and then the unknown unknowns. When did life begin? Well. Sometime during the Earth's first billion years, but we do not know when. Where did it begin? Well, maybe at deep sea vents, maybe in submarine, sub, sub sea floor mud, maybe in lagoons, maybe in a combination, maybe in a whole bunch of different environments. We don't know. The, the sequential stages are pretty well set up, but what about the types of polymers, compartmentalization? The uh, pre-RNA genetic material, genetics, metabolism, how late? Uh, there, were there many origins of life and uh, the last common ancestor is simply survivors or not? We don't know that. And we don't know whether life is common or rare in the cosmos. And with that, I end this harangue and I thank you for your attention.